All right, welcome everybody. We'll go ahead and get started. Get y'all's attention. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the SunTrust Auditorium. Thank you all for coming out for Alumni Weekend. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Dean and the uh, Alumni Relations Office, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you again for your time today. And a special welcome to those uh, joining us via the live stream. Um, hope everyone had an opportunity to enjoy brunch today over at the Art Museum. It's uh, always not too shabby of a setting and the, the weather cooperated today, so we got pretty lucky there. And um, after this event, just a reminder, over in the Bush uh, Auditorium, we're going to have Dr. Craig McAllister's last lecture, which is kind of an academic tradition here uh, upon retirement, so please don't miss that. Um, that will start right at 3 o'clock. Uh, so we'll, we'll wrap up here about 2.30, so have some time to go across um, the, the walkway and, and catch that lecture. Uh, my name is CJ Mayer. I am a 2011 uh, Crummer alumni uh, graduate, and I serve as the vice president on the alumni board. Um, I myself work for a technology company named Crown Castle. We do wireless infrastructure, so I am especially excited to see this panel today. Um, and you're, you guys are all in for a real treat here. We've got uh, several members of our faculty, and um, today I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Dr. Pete McElinden, and he is the entrepreneur in residence here at the Crummer School of Business. So with that, Pete. Great. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, we have a, a panel of us, esteemed, esteemed colleagues here to talk to you about a really interesting thing that's happening in our business world today. You know, there's a lot of discussion about how Amazon is taking over the world and how all the, the big brick and mortar stores are kind of on the ropes or declaring bankruptcy. While at the same time, you have a lot of the online retailers who are pursuing more brick and mortar opportunities. So let me introduce today's panel. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Professor Johnston, welcome and thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Kaiser, thank you for being here as well. Thank you, Pete. And Professor Grimm, thank, thank you. Thank you. And welcome. So according to Adweek, November 2017, so just a few months ago, last year for the first time, more shoppers said the internet would be their top destination for shopping at 55%. Uh, moving mass merchants to second place at 44%. Is this a trend that you see continuing among brick and mortar and e-commerce? Yes, it's a trend that starts, you know, you go back 10 years as the internet began to come on and um, it, it, it became, it started as a very small piece of the pie, but now people are doing the vast majority of the research online for many products and as people have become more comfortable using the internet, the ability to purchase has been made easier. Uh, and so uh, the, the trend line is really exponential in terms of growth and no immediate signs that it's going to slow down anytime soon. Yeah, so what does that tell us about the brick and mortar opportunities? Are they going to go away ultimately or do they still have a role in what we're doing business-wise today? And actually, I'll open it up to Professor Kaiser, why don't you? Thank you, Pete. So I think um, the trend, the 55 and the 44 percent for the online versus brick and mortar, I think that's indicative of the general sense of where retail is heading, but I don't think it's going to continue to shift completely over to online only. I think from a consumer behavior standpoint, consumers want to still engage with their product. They want to feel, touch, they want to socialize, they want to engage with other consumers. So I don't think it means the death of brick and mortar. I think it means opportunities for brick and mortar to compare or excuse me, to converge the online environment with the brick and mortar environment. I think as human beings, we don't shift our way of human behavior completely, we modify it. Mm -hmm. And so brick and mortar stores are gonna have to modify their retail environments to actually engage consumers who have a propensity or a desire for online shopping. And Dr. Kaiser, do you see a generational difference in changing those behaviors and understanding them? For which side, brick and mortar or for online? <laughs> for, actually for both. For both, okay, so I think generationally, uh, Gen X and baby boomers are absolutely okay with shopping online. Actually, I think all cohorts are um, fine with shopping online, but I think, uh, I don't think it's a generational effect more so than a situational or a life stage effect. 
I think that life stage is more indicative of how we shop and what we desire from the shopping um, environment or the experience more so than cohorts. Because within each cohort, there are subsegments, and um, it's really hard to pinpoint the subsegments of behavior within each generational cohort. So I think it's a complex uh, formula, formula, if you will, to decide who's more into online shopping versus brick and mortar within each generational cohort. Yeah, and obviously that opens a lot of opportunities for new, new marketing and new ways into the psyche of the consumer. Absolutely. Well, the challenge today, I think, is that it's, it's, it's not high tech or high touch. It's both. It's and, right? I mean, the, the, the key today is people want an experience. So they can get some of that experience online, but they can't get the entire experience. And where you see the, the challenge for retailers today is the answer, the answer the question, why do I need a brick and mortar? Because if you can't answer that question, if you can't say, I'm going to create a unique experience, then the easier thing is to sit at home in your pajamas and order the stuff, right? So the, the challenge today in retailing is, it, it, Tracy's right, I mean, it's, it's, it's not that people don't want an experience, it's not that they're, they're not willing to go out and engage the community, whatever that looks like, but the challenge for the retailer is, um, w what am I delivering when somebody comes to my brick and mortar? What's special about me? Which is very different from, you know, years ago where all they had to do was put the stuff on the shelf because that was the only way to get it. Now I can get it in another way. So that advantage of having a brick and mortar on the corner is gone. Um, but there are certainly, and we, and we see success in certain types of retailing by creating a unique experience. People will pay for a unique experience. Yeah, very good, thank you. you Professor know, Graham, what are your thoughts? I don't know, five to seven years ago, I and a couple of people said we should short all shopping centers. Problem is you couldn't short them. <laughs> well, you probably could find some owned by some REITs, but you walk into Fashion Square, it's so damn depressing, it's unbelievable. Walk into Millennium, it's unbelievable the other way. And you, why is that? Well, I don't know the answer to that. But, you know, retailers used to pick the merchandise for us out of the hundreds of things out there. Well. The internet is disintermediates that. And now we're overwhelmed with the choices we can find on the internet. So the question will it really is, will ultimately somebody come back in, like retailers, to select things out for us and say, instead of that 200, we'll give you 10 to choose from. I don't know. But it all depends on the type of merchandise. And we're going to get to that. I think, why, why, does, <clears throat> why does Microsoft have a store? That, that's unexplainable. Why does Amazon have a store? That's explainable. But they're, they're Except the, the, Microsoft, the Microsoft store at uh, Millennia is empty, and one floor below at the Apple store, you can't get That's in. standing room. So. Yeah. Uh, you, you must have read the list of questions. <laughs> Sorry, Pete. Go ahead. Because <laughs> that, that really gets to the question of, and I agree that there's, there's an experience that happens. At the Mall of Millennia, you know, there's some research that indicates the higher level um, price, of, price points of certain goods are reserved for the experiential part of buying it and interfacing with the, the companies that develop them and getting some, some firsthand uh, experience in the sales process. Amazon is kind of a, you know what you're looking for, you order it, it shows up, it's more of a utility cost than anything. So let's talk a little bit about that, the buying experience and why certain malls thrive and others don't, and why it's up to us as the consumers and how these these companies really begin to learn about what it is that we're demanding from them. So, Mark, if you'd like to start. Well, you know, a lot of talk today. When, let me loop back to one thing first, okay, sure. is, is when we talk about tech, tech is, means so many different things, right? So it means uh, traditionally online, the internet, but today that means tech is artificial intelligence, right? Tech is mobile. So it's, it's much more varied than simply calling it tech. It's, it's quite specific to a certain kind of technology. And I think the challenge today is when we, we look at these varieties of technologies available, retailers are trying to discern what technologies can I leverage. So for example, we take a look at, at Starbucks, right? So um, I don't know how many of you have the Starbucks app on your phone and how many of you use it, but a lot of people do. And an increasing amount of business, it started as nothing, and now it's a, it's, it's a good chunk of their business. 
uh, is being driven through the through the use of the mobile app. Um, and and we and we talk a lot about Amazon, right? Well, what makes Amazon a, a, a good shopping experience for many people? It's the ease of use and their ability to apply their form of artificial intelligence to make our shopping easier. And uh, you know, all those suggestions at the bottom and all that stuff just makes it easier for us to shop. Every retailer and conversely, Amazon and all the online retailers are asking just the opposite question, right? So where, how do I get closer to the customer? And, and of course, this represents the, the, the challenge. You know, Bill's comment about the product mix here is, is really quite relevant because today, in addition to the technology, all retailers have to ask the question, you know, not only what's my experience, but what am I carrying? And we see companies developing very different strategies. So for example, Costco has an online strategy, which is different from their in-store strategy. They carry different products. Um, some products overlap, but, but they carry different products. So, um, you know, th this is the fundamental question that companies are asking is what is the basic strategy, not just around the experience, but also around the product mix. That makes, and it makes a lot of sense, sure. Dr. Kaiser, your thoughts on kind of the mix and how these organizations are moving forward and figuring out how to really a appeal and drive revenue from those that like to shop online and in store? I think um, for companies like Amazon, certainly artificial intelligence um, is essential to understanding product assortment and consumer response to those particular items that are offered. So what we're finding in the traditional brick and mortar retail stores is that we have shoppers or buyers, especially in the fashion retail industry. Um, and so it's not as much as big data that's driving some of those decisions. And so I think for online um, consumers who like to shop online as well as in brick and mortar stores, I think that retailers need to use high data or big data that's very customizable to the type of consumers that shop in their stores to really customize or personalize the brick and mortar shopping experience. And I'll give you an example. A lot of companies are using um, data analytics now to figure out who comes to their websites. And so now you can create a segmentation profile based on how long they spend on your landing page, how many minutes they spend on the subsequent page that they click on, and what they're hovering over or looking at. So consumers, I mean, so companies now use that data to figure out the top five segments of consumers who come to their online or corporate site. I think retailers have to do something similar. So when you have the data from purchases inside of the retail environment, you have to figure out what are the segments of consumers. Let's take the Millennium Mall, for instance. If those are the consumers who are going to Macy's, what are the top five segments of consumers that go into the Macy's store? And what type of experience are they looking for? And what type of items are they buying? So I think retailers who are in the brick and mortar space have to do a much better job of using um, data to figure out how to meet the consumer where they are once they're inside of the retail environment without being too creepy because we don't want our phones tracked when we're inside of the store. We don't want to know that Macy's is tracking our texts or they're look, they know that we're on our phone and are pushing out messages. I think that will trouble some of us. It will trouble me for sure. Um, so I think we have to, retailers have to do it in a very sophisticated way to deliver a great value proposition without scaring the customer away. I think retail is dead. <laughs> Except for What do you really think, Bill? Tell us <laughs> what you really think. <laughs> that sounds like yeah. a headline of a lot Except of what we've read. Except for specialty items. And if I think about what's at the Millennium Mall, those are stores typically that you would not go online for. Whereas you go into Fashion Square, that just killed Fashion Square because you could buy that stuff instantly on the on the internet. Well, I just read where shopping center owners are now trying to figure out who to have as tenants based on that. So it used to be you'd, tra you'd count on walking by traffic in a shopping center. That's not that's not true. You're not going to do that. People have to come to your store for that reason and they go straight to that store in the, in the shopping center. I do know a lot of people do that at the Millennium because they're bothered by all the other clutter there. But anyway, so retail to me is dead, in general. Say again? I mean, which ones are open? <laughs> well, there are all these really low cost stuff, although I guess, um, help me, the two department stores on either end are still open. 
but they're totally dead. Yeah, D yeah. Dillard's went out. And yeah. Anyway, it's it's a totally dead uh, shopping center. See, well, they've torn down about a half of it now, and they're putting up this giant uh, Home Depot type thing. It is, it is now. It is now. <laughs> but now the world will know. <laughs> Buying online, you don't have to factor in that brick and mortar, you know, upgrading costs for those same items, right? So, how does yeah. that factor into it? What you see is a lot of um, retailers, and I'll, I'll use Best Buy as an example. Best Buy's price matching, right? They will price match anything you find on the, if it's the equivalent product. They'll price match it. So I, I think that they're being driven to price matching. With respect to consumer safety, you know, I, I, I can remember 10 years ago, the issue of safety was I didn't want to shop online because I didn't think it was safe, right? Uh, so today it's kind of flipped, right? So now I'm afraid to go to the mall, uh, particularly if it's empty or something. But, um, <laughs> but you know, it, it, the, the interesting thing in our conversation is I, I did a TV thing a few weeks ago, and, and the gist of the TV was, uh, well, so Amazon's going to take over the world. And um, I said, well, you know, in 1965, Sears was going to take over the world. And when was the last time we ever went to a Sears, right? In 1990, Walmart was going to take over the world. Break up Walmart, right? Because... Walmart was destroying this, and Sears was just, and now it's 2018, and, and Amazon is destroying things. There will be another model. I, I don't know what that model is, but um, there will be another model. Right now, we're seeing the transition into this kind of hybrid economy. Companies are using technology. They're leveraging technology to take the pain out of shopping, right? It's... Uh, I, you know, for me, going to the mall, I'd rather go to my dentist. But my wife and daughter, even now, I hate to tell you, they still like to go shopping. But um, the challenge today is, I think, companies are trying to figure out how do we not do one or the other, but how do we do both? Because both will survive, yeah, I, I think. I think it's interesting that you bring up consumer safety. Because when I think of the retail and safety intersection, I think of holiday shopping um, and how people are stampeded, they're trampled upon, and then people are breaking into cars at malls, taking a lot of the shopper um, goods out of their cars. And so I think that goes down to the very essence of human behavior, right? So we always want to feel safe. We always want to have good experiences. And then for those people who like to gift, the gifting nature of holiday shopping means that we want to protect the ones and the things that we buy for people that we love, which is why I think the retail environment, unfortunately, is going to survive. Um, <laughs> because, because as human beings, we have a tendency to, number one, to do what we know and to do what we like, but we're also aware of how those interactions and how those steps interact with our environment. And I think that's a benefit for online. But once again, it's holiday shopping. It's a tradition. It's an experience. And so when you think about tradition and experience, Retail still has a leg in this fight, if you will, um, which is why it doesn't go away. But I think you're absolutely spot on with the consumer safety. I think people will shop online to prevent safety issues and also crowding. Millennia Mall is great, but it's always crowded. And if you want to be a part of the crowd experience, and so be it. I'd rather be in an empty mall than a crowded shopping center. Um, but I well, think uh, Tracy's in love with all brands. <laughs> She's a, she is the guardian of all brands. You probably don't know that. <laughs> Right. Have, we're going to have a shopping date at the Fashion Square Mall one day. So. <laughs> well, that'll uh -oh. be short. You know, <laughs> you know if, if, it's a, if it's a minute or two, I'll be there with my camera. It'll go viral on YouTube. Yeah, okay. There's a good Crummer promotion. <laughs> yeah, Dan, please.
uh, I'll buy products that I pay a little more than going into the store. Uh, part of it is the convenience factor. Uh, I still buy my groceries at a grocery store, but I see more and more of the shipped company and other companies that are doing the grocery shopping and delivering it for you when you get convenience you pay a little bit more. I think it's uh, two parts. One is the convenience factor. I can get Amazon same day delivery, second day delivery pretty much anywhere now. Um, and then the other part is I have access, like uh, I think uh, Dr. Griffin said, uh, you have access to a, a larger uh, number of products out there, and you know, do we need that many choices? But I can go to a company that's maybe a smaller company shipping out of Wisconsin that I never would have had access to, and they build a community around their company and their products, so I still feel like I belong to something and I'm supporting something that I'm willing to pay that extra, you know, premium on. So you just yeah. Uh, but, you know, th th there's this classic kind of perception in marketing about price, right? So you can either get it better or you can get it cheaper. And, of course, we know today that what do we want? I want both. I want good and cheap, right? So price is becoming kind of an equalizer, right? The, the perception that online is necessarily cheaper isn't correct. Um, you can pay more. And it, it, it's like retailing, right? We have to do our homework. If we don't do our homework as consumers, then the price we're paying may not, we need a reference price. And so if we don't have that kind of research, then there's no guarantee that because we order it on Amazon, it's necessarily cheaper. And, and I think human nature, and I, and I totally agree with the, human nature really hasn't changed. What am I looking for in a shopping experience? I do want a shopping experience. I like to experience something where it's, it's found and discovered versus I know what I'm looking for, just buy it on Amazon and so on. I'm also looking for safety. I'm also looking for anti-theft type things. It should surprise no one that Amazon bought Ring, the doorbell camera. They got a little creepy, Amazon did, when they said, hey, give us the code to your house and we'll <laughs> put it right in your house. Uh, how about no? <laughs> So the ring acquisition recently for the billion plus dollars makes a lot of sense because now you know who delivered the package, you know who picked it up from your front porch, friend or foe, and you at least have some record of these things happening. But of course then uh, Amazon's purchase of our favorite organic Whole healthy yes. food chain, right? Yes, and we're gonna, um, we're gonna, and that's on the list to talk about oh. today because food. Sorry, and, Pete. But the, and it, it's a good segue though, because Dan, you know, you're talking about the coffee subscriptions and you're talking about all these things that make your life and my life more convenient. I would love to have a healthy meal delivered to me anytime I was hungry. Actually, I hope Amazon's not listening because they would be <laughs> delivering right here, right now. <laughs> but hey, the, hey, but the big data play, I mean, they will know what you're looking for, kind of health that you are expecting from what's being delivered and all of this data is being tracked and you talk about things all of you that are wearing an Apple watch or a Fitbit watch they know your general health pretty well 10,000 steps a day consistently you'll order the salmon not the dozen Krispy Kreme donuts for those of us that do less than a thousand steps a day <laughs> um, so they'll be they'll be monitoring all of that and as long as they're getting back to the human nature of what are the things you're looking for convenience at least competitive cost or value and is retail necessarily dead i think it's going to have to pivot substantially to find the groups that matter most okay i'd like to flip it to what would you invest in what we've just done is put ourselves in the shoes of customers yeah bitcoin now now the <laughs> Okay. Well, <laughs> Pete's credibility just went down to 10, 10%. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, I, I, that's a mystery. What in the world do you invest in if you're interested in this whole issue of retail? Yep. Well, in know. the short term, you invest in Amazon. Home Depot? <laughs> I don't know. I, there was something I, I wanted to ask somebody. <clears throat> Amazon, I think, paid $22 billion for Whole Foods. Where did those dollars come from? U.S. dollars or offshore dollars? That's just a test. You've, you've been reading the 10Ks of these companies. <laughs> I have been you? reading the 10Ks. <laughs> you know, there's a phenomenal amount of money. We all know, know that it's over, overseas yeah. because the profits were made over there, theoretically. 
I saw that in Apple. <clears throat> Apple has $133 billion offshore. Let me think about that. $127 billion is still in cash. Well, in cash equivalents. They can't use that money to invest over there in any operating companies. And they're not about to use that money that will reduce their own bottom line by increasing R&D. It's a really interesting phenomenon, and we all know that. They want to use that money, basically, to buy back shares and to have large dividends, at least for a while. But it also forces them to buy companies, which is why they've been doing that for these un unbelievable prices. It's uh, because, of, first of all, they have the cash. <clears throat> and second, accounting-wise, they do not have to amortize the goodwill when they buy a company. It used to be you had to amortize goodwill, which killed almost all acquisitions. <clears throat> they don't have to do that anymore. So they, the only use of that money, other than shareholder stuff, is to buy companies, which they are doing. Amazon's doing it. Apple's certainly doing it. You talk about Apple <clears throat> and the discussion we're having. So Apple projects that very soon, we, we think of Apple as a stuff, right, as a product company. So we have one in our pocket, we maybe have a tablet, whatever. You know what Amazon projects? That their business going forward will be a services company. They're gonna drive more revenue from Apple Music and Apple this and their services than they are from the stuff. The stuff they make will simply be a conduit for us to buy more of their services. So they're actually, you know, we talk about high touch, high tech. They're, well, they clearly are high tech, but they're looking at their business transitioning to uh, more of an online model and a, and a services business. It's interesting because there's a bit of a danger to that. So they then control the content. Purchase and you're online. So violate a term of their service, which I don't know how many people actually read those, probably not many, uh, you can actually be cut off from the things you've purchased. And you read the article recently about that, right? Where they had the stories of the woman that was cut off at Amazon. Big hole in it because she was connected to the world through her Amazon account. So there's a social media piece to Amazon, a big one in a very different way than all the traditional social media sites. focused on that one niche. 
And that was an eye transfer from that to why are the Apple stores so successful? And why are the Microsoft stores? Well, here's, yeah, here's but what's what's behind it? What's what's causing that? So well, I, what is it behind a brand that creates that kind of excitement? Please, Dr. Kaiser, go ahead. So, so I, I I love the Apple model because app, you know a lot of people think Apple is like you know the top tier brand for everything, right? And so they do a lot of things phenomenally well. But what I think has really catapulted Apple into the space where they are, where Microsoft can't compete, is that Apple has a strong understanding of consumers. I'm a consumer behaviorist, so I'm a behavioral researcher and I study the psychology of consumption day in and day out. And so I think Apple has found a way to number one, understand human beliefs, and they've managed how to manipulate, provide, and communicate to those beliefs inside of consumers. And so now there's a stickiness, it's like a contagion. And so you can't break that relationship from Apple because they understand who we are as human beings and what we need to survive and how it makes us feel. Their first commercial for, I think, the iPhone 6, I believe, was the hello ad. And it was all about human connectedness. And the ad featured people saying hello in maybe 25, 30 different languages. And so even if you didn't understand the language, you understood that when you woke up in the morning, you text your significant other good morning or hello or when you called your mom and dad, you were just happy to hear their voice in another language, you saw the connection. Yeah. And so I think that Apple has figured out the human essence, which is kind of creepy, yeah. right? Because it's like that, artificial intelligence. And, and let, let me add something to that. If you go back to 1984, yeah. when I oh, bought yeah. my first Mac, oh, yeah. it said hello on the screen. Yeah. And that that's was the human computer connection. That's right. that's right. And that's where they started. So they, they continued to evolve from the, this is a computer mere mortals can use. You know, the IBM PC was out at the time. None of you remember floppy disks, but you know, that's the way we used to store our information. And now the evolution has, they have enough data, certainly enough of everything to say, now it's human to human connection. Technologies just helps facilitate. No, people are no longer afraid of machines like they were in 1984. So they've been bucking the system yes. since the introduction of the first Mac. It, it, that's all right. Yeah, the Super Bowl ad. Yeah. Well, the iconic yeah. ad. The, 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 of course, the thing is with Apple, right, is um, when you're small, you're going against the big guy. But now you're the big guy. So there's really, when you're number one, what direction can you go? There's only one direction. And this is the challenge. I mean, you know, we talk about the success of the Apple source, and it is hugely successful. Just go to Mall of Millennia. But the, but the challenge is when you... When you start reading now, they are a victim of their success because people are starting to find Apple stores. I go in there and I have to wait 40 minutes to get help. And I'm treated like a number and I can't get my, my iPhone serviced and, and all of these things. So, you know, the, you, when you walked into an Apple store in 2012, um, you, could get, you could experience Apple. When you walk into an Apple store today, particularly some Apple stores, it's starting to look a little bit more like mundane, right? So you're going to short and Apple? Never. Is that what you're I would do? not not in the immediate future. <laughs> but you, you know, it's. Um, but but I will say, I mean, every, every ch the challenge with every company. This is a basic business strategy question, right? Is what what's the problem with success? The problem with success is, what do we change? Right. When you walk, when, you know, Steve Jobs is one of the reasons that Apple's been credited with so much success is Steve Jobs could walk into a room and say, we're going to kill the optical drive on our next computer, which was the MacBook Air. And everybody said, no one's going to buy a MacBook Air because you need a CD tray because you're going to read all those CDs. So Steve Jobs says, now, you know, you know, people are going to download this stuff from the Internet. Forget it. He comes out with the iPad. No one's going to buy an iPad. What the heck is that? It's nine inches. He, he was right. But the challenge is, is when you become a victim, when you become successful, you have to get in a room and start saying, we're going to kill this and we're going to change that. And what, one of the things that's happening in the world we live in today is the, the high technology is, is changing the way, if we talk about the original discussion we started with 40 minutes ago, on, on retailing, it's forcing retailers to say the model we've used isn't working. 
And so we have to think of a new model. You know, uh, just a, a quick sideline here. The, the issue with Amazon, right? We know Amazon because we shop on Amazon. We're, what is one huge piece of Amazon's business? It's not us. What is it? It's, it's the cloud service. It's all the back office stuff. A lot of those online retailers that we're shopping at, the back office is done by Amazon because they have the infrastructure to do it. So here's, here's the thing. And they take 40%. And they the take, I didn't realize it was that much. Yeah, 40%. So the, 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 some of you in this room are old enough to remember a, a, a store called Toys R Us, <laughs> right? Hey, 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 they're still around. They're, they're, Just so you know, they, billionaires put a bid in uh, uh, to revive them. So. The brand, I think, the <laughs> stores are gone. But the, the, you know, the, a lot of uh, analysis about uh, the, you know, kind of why the obituary of what happened. But one of the things that was identified very early in the death of Toys R Us was it's the early 2000s. And they're thinking, we're brick and mortar, we're brick and mortar, we're brick and mortar. And they came out and they announced, we've got this brilliant strategy. We are now have an internet strategy. We've turned over everything to Amazon. Okay, great, boy. And they got great, it's like, wow, that's brilliant, you guys. Except what happened? Toys R Us never needed to develop. They turned all of that over to Amazon. Amazon's like, we'll collect all that data. We'll study all that stuff. We'll look at how people shop. And they never developed an online strategy. And in 2018, they basically said, we never had an online strategy because we turned it all over to Amazon in 2002 or 2005, whatever it was. So, you know, Amazon is collecting information. You know, at the end of the day, it's all about information. What's Google want from us? Why is Maps free? Why is Google free? Because it's all about information. Amazon's collecting information because they put us in groups and then they start analyzing that so that they know based on all that information, what, and this is the key, uh, that when we, we, we look at high tech versus high touch, I think the real challenge from Amazon is if you simply, if you're, an, if you're a retailer and you turn over your back office to Amazon, you know, my friend is my enemy, my enemy is my, and that's what, you know, will happen. Turn it over to them and they'll be happy to take it on, but then you need to develop your own online strategy. You need a strategy. Yeah, and, and speaking to the entrepreneurs in the room, you get the whole market segmentation, really understanding who your buyers are better than an Amazon might because you're face-to-face -face with them, you have conversations with them, something Amazon does through data, you do through regular old human human to human, human interaction. And I think that's a big part of why, believe it or not, here's the irony in what we're talking about today, Amazon now opening up bookstores to sell the best-selling books in certain areas. No two bookstores will be the same because they know each area, each demographic will have certain tastes for certain books. And of course, you need your coffee. They'll, be, they'll have that there, pretty high margin. Uh, low cost for them, they'll have the data on all of that kind of stuff. And you'll be able to buy all the other books that are related to the one you really want to buy on Kindle for basically nothing. You know, the, the beneficiaries of all of this change are FedEx and UPS. Because but for them, the internet delivery services wouldn't exist. Yeah, well, drones are coming soon. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> if there's anybody who's gonna fly them, it's you. Yeah, I, have, I, I will take that contract. <laughs> yes, I, cer I certainly will. <laughs> well, I was just gonna say um, quickly, going back to the Apple versus Microsoft store comparison, I think that one thing that Apple also has done well, other than understanding human behavior, is that they've always challenged the status quo. Microsoft has been very complacent being the status quo. And I think that consumers are now in an age where we want to be challenged. We want to be um, interested in change and we want to see innovation right in front of us. And we want to see how those changes are going to be done by the product inside of the store. And I think Microsoft hasn't figured out how to use innovation as a part of their brand fabric, whereas Apple has figured that out. Yeah. And so people go into the store for that innovative experience or to learn or to just explore the opportunities yeah. with the products. Yeah, very good. Um, and, oh, go ahead. Um, isn't that the same path that all dominant companies have experienced? IBM was there after IBM was Dell or Microsoft and Dell. And Apple has a, a bone to pick with Microsoft since the conception of Microsoft, right? So they're always trying to outdo Microsoft. Right. Right. 
you know the relationship between Microsoft and Apple. I mean, my, Apple exists in part because Bill Gates threw a bunch of money at him when they they couldn't sell a computer at Apple to for an for the price of an Apple. So um, you know, it's it's a little bit of a circular. I love you, but you know. All these companies, when you look at the tech giants, they all realize they can look at history. They know what it looks like. And they, they can see that they're faced with this challenge. When you're Google and you have 80% of online search or whatever it is, uh, you know, you're sitting there going, what's our next business? If you're Amazon, you're, you're looking to what is next? They, they, they all see that we have to stay hungry and we have, to, we have to keep investing in what is the next thing, whatever that is. Because there is going to be a next thing. Yeah. But Microsoft's yeah. not doing it well. So I think that's a really interesting well, question. Yeah. Like, no, why can't they do it well? Tracy, I'll bet you Microsoft thinks they're doing great. <laughs> you, you know they're full of smart people, just like Apple is. Yeah. But they have uh, they have momentum in the background that they can't change very easily. You see, you know, it's very interesting because actually, w Microsoft is kicking it right now. Where are they kicking it? <laughs> they're not kicking it because yeah. we're buying more Xboxes. Yeah, Where are they services. kicking it? Oh, yeah. Cloud yeah. services. Yep. Oh yeah. They are. Uh, yeah, the back end. Yeah, well, that's right. That's right. right. And you know, Microsoft has always been kind of a back end kind of a place with exchange and the servers and stuff. But Microsoft, I, I think if you talk to, what was it, Sedella, the guy, the CEO, I don't think he'd be unhappy at all. I don't know that they, they they're not going to sell an iPhone, or they're not going to, well, they're not going to sell phones, but he said, all right, we're moving on past that. Well, that's yeah. an interesting, uh, what I saw were quotes <clears throat> by Microsoft about their stores. Oh, yeah. Well, their stores are. And, and what they said was, they're not there to sell product. But what, well, yeah. they're, they're there at first to have a show place for their products. But what did Steve Jobs it. say when they opened up the Apple stores? Damn to find he, he said the same thing. Yeah. He said, <laughs> that's, um, we're, we're, we're here. He, he opened the Apple store because he said, you know what? Everybody that is selling Apple stuff now is doing a terrible job. They're not yeah. presenting Apple well. And, and so, as I recall, his first one was on Fifth Avenue, as I recall, in New York City. <laughs> That probably only was like $400 million. That's probably an exaggeration, but it is an incredible store. Even today, you can hardly get in that store. Yeah. But I saw, it's I found closed, that quote think, by but... Microsoft to be interesting. Yeah. And what they said also, they have set their uh, retail stores up for space in the back, a really nice space to meet with businesses because they're target small business. Yeah. T to me, Microsoft and Apple have always had very different user bases. Apple has always catered to the folks that just want stuff to work. Their claim to fame is when you look at an iPhone and there's one button on the front, you push it. Uh, some icons come up, you say, ooh, some graphical identification of what I need to do next. When you took a look, take a look at some of the phones that preceded the iPhone and it's like, ooh, nine buttons. I wonder where the on button is. <laughs> so this user experience, user interface really began to drive the hello from the first from the first Mac introduction, and certainly to what we have today. Microsoft then catered to the developers. Their group is, help us really get computer technology to the masses. And computer programmers, myself included, malls, not so much. I already know about the tech of the systems you're trying to sell me. I can watch any number of things online, talk to a bunch of friends, participate in forums, something Apple users rarely do increasing in number, but rarely do. So why would I need to visit a store when I have all the information that I need? So it's just a different mental model. And I think that's driving it a lot. Go ahead. Jerry the professor on retail is dead, and since I've graduated, you can't change my grade. Snatch a limitation. And Dr. Vance was my marketing professor, and he liked me. <laughs> the past four months, I have gone into a Jersey Bank store and a Brooks Brothers outlet store, 
and I go in the stores maybe once or twice in those <coughs> stores. Jerry, nice to see you. Mr. Curley, good to see you. How are you doing? The internet cannot replace that personal service. It's like going to your favorite bar and walking in. Jerry, are you having your usual? The internet is a nice thing. I could probably buy Brooks Brothers and Jose Bank online, but I can't get the personal attention and treat it like I'm something special online. Oh, this, this is ultimately the It's ultimately the Yeah, well said for exactly what the difference is. because we have two, one in California and one in New York, perhaps. And you can fly to the UK and we'll fit you and so on, but we have to replicate that experience because we do have brick and mortar for the folks that like the custom fit suit. They're measured, all that kind of stuff. And then the other folks say, you know, if it doesn't fit, you have a guarantee. You have a call. How did it fit? Help us understand what we can do to better serve you. Right. Yep, that's right. <clears throat> yeah. And then you become the great champion for that company to say, you don't have to be in store to have the experience I had. Let me educate you on exactly what it means for an online shopping experience now. So the gap is narrowing, but can you well, ever get it close enough where it makes a difference between see, and online I think, or in I want, e I just Let me just say, because he, here's the thing. I think we're also looking at this and we see technology and, and the ability to do online shopping moving through product categories, right? So when was the last time we went and bought a movie? I don't even know if you can actually buy a physical movie anymore. <laughs> um, you can, okay. But it, you know, but how yeah, do we get most of our right? Okay, and, and the same with music. And we, we look, that goes back 10 years, right? And um, we're seeing, you know, products that even maybe five, six years ago, thinking, I, I will never buy my groceries online. I'll always go to Publix or whatever, right? And yet my wife's like, yeah, let me hop on tonight and order a bunch of stuff from Costco or Walmart. And it's not, we, we, she's still at Publix all the time, but we see that sliding scale. And of course we talk about Amazon buying Whole Foods and you know, we, we see this kind of product category by product category. And one of, the, one of these areas is clothing, right? So clothing is one where we tend to, we wanna try it on. But this is of course where we see these things like artificial intelligence, where we can, you know, I, it, the retailers are starting to look for ways to create online experiences that start to mirror what we experience in the store. I was reading uh, thinking about today, I was reading, you know, those of you that buy a home, you know, one of the things we have to do is we've got to go through the mortgage, right? We've got to go through the mortgage process where you're being interviewed and you got to fill out these forms and then the mortgage officer and all that. Bank of America has introduced this uh, digital mortgage experience where you never see anybody. Mm -hmm. Everything is done online and you get online chat and you get all of this taken care of. And their claim to fame is they're saying they're going to do it much faster than the whatever 30 days or what it takes now. And the idea is this is an experience that normally when you do it is quite interactive and requires phone calls and things like this. And they're saying, you, we don't need to do that. Yeah, it's interesting too. And Professor Grimm, let me ask you this question or get you involved. A lot of people like the art of the deal. They like to negotiate, they like to haggle. They like to go into a store and say, yeah, yeah, yeah I know stuff is on sale, but how about another 10% off? Do you have a discount that applies to who I am and so on? Because they're happening more and more online, but certainly not at the same level they are in store now. Do you think the store might know that you're going to hag haggle with them, Pete? <laughs> well, that's why they don't let me in anymore. <laughs> yes, yes. And they know, they know, like, when I go into Best Buy with my folder of information. It's let like, me come back out. to the Brooks Brothers. He's absolutely <laughs> right about it. Specialty retail will survive. 
How would you ever buy a, a major appliance online? Probably not. There are other things like that that we're not going to buy online. That's then that's parts true. I love what what Tracy does in terms of the customer behavior because that's really fundamental to everything that we do. But there are some that are going to survive. And the other thing is, once again, if we go back and say <clears throat> the internet is a dis intermediator. They cut out something in the system. And that's what happened at Bank of America. And, and the, the companies that do that tend to be entrepreneurial companies. <clears throat> they step back and say, wait a second. I think I can cut that piece out. So it's usually, why, why aren't the big guys seeing the same thing? I wonder. Yeah. Well, that's what we're teaching, right? Entrepreneurial thinking. That's See right. it in a different way. Yeah. Well, and it, Oh, you had a question like five minutes ago. I'm sorry. Well, As soon as you said, as soon as a product becomes commoditized, it's going to be bought online. Yep. And then what's the, the Amazon dash buttons? Mm -hmm. You have one right on your washing machine. Hey, you know, you haven't ordered Tide in three months, and we know you're out every two and a half months. Just push the button, and it'll be at your front door tomorrow. Yes, commoditized products versus specialty retail. I think that's, that's going to be the but decision going forward. We take a look at what you're describing here. Th this phenomenon started 10 years ago, seven, eight years ago. And it, we, we saw it first in Best Buy. And they had, maybe you've read this because it's been talked a lot about showrooming, right? Yeah. Where people were going to Best Buy, looking at the wall of TVs, and then going back yeah. to Amazon. And I mean, I can remember um, eight, nine years ago thinking, I would never buy a TV from Amazon because what the heck is it going to show up in a million pieces? Yeah. Um, but that's what in fact happened is that, uh, and Best Buy ha has almost, well, almost went out of business and they're trying to come back with a much stronger, more powerful online strategy. So we, we see this happen. I just want to come back one last thing about sure. Pete haggling online. Um, one of the things I read recently was the dark side of all this information and, and uh, you know, the artificial intelligence, the ability to analyze a lot of data is that um, companies now are looking at uh, how often you return products as one little thing. And so yeah, you're going to get blackballed. Uh, so you can get yeah. blackballed, yeah. right? Yeah. So the, 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 and a, there's a third party companies have been doing this, but um, there's a third party, at least one where they're analyzing all this data. And the story I read in the article was this guy had bought a, a maybe you read this article, he, read a, he bought a phone and four cases for his son to pick which one, right? We do that at my house. Uh, and we'll buy, my wife will buy four dresses for my daughter and you know pick one. So he buys four cases and he brings them home. The son picks one, he takes the other three back and they go, nope. And he goes, no, 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 I just bought this like a few days ago. I'm, with, I'm following the policy. Here's my receipt. It's within 14 days. Nope, you've been blackballed. Your score is too high in terms of returns. So you, you are now banned from returning products at Best Buy. Wow. No, at the, at, the, at the brick and mortar. The cost of restocking inventory, I think, is roughly, I think, 10 to 15% of the actual product price. Yeah, and sure. so you're costing the company money every time you make a return. That's right. And so Target has a system where they will tell you that you have one more return before we put you on our no return list. And so they're really good about communicating it beforehand. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say really quickly, too, to Troy's comment about the leverage of the brand when it becomes commoditized, 
I think this is a great time to talk about the importance of branding because even when products become commoditized, that brand relationship or that brand engagement has to proceed with the consumer before it goes into an online environment. Mm -hmm. And I think we have, we, we have great conversations as branded content dead, much like is the retail brick and mortar dead. And I don't think branded content is dead. I think it needs to uh, happen before the consumer goes into an online situation to continue um, their relationship. But certainly if you find a new brand online and you like it and you become a loyal customer, certainly that's possible too. But I think we should also um, keep in mind that the brand relationship should certainly be in place before we go into the online environment um, for our shopping patterns. Yeah, excellent point. I think it's 10 to 15%. It's like reverse inventory. <clears throat> well, and that's why they charge you sometimes a restocking fee. Yes. That's why yeah. those percentages yeah. are almost identical. Yeah. Yep. It's back through the system, and if it has to be sold as used, it's, it's a big hit to them. Yep. <laughs> All right, we only have a few minutes left, unfortunately. Can we answer some questions from some of you? Yes, sir, you've had your hand up in the back before, please. Interaction and how you can't replace it. So you have me, I'm a Gen Xer, right? I'm self-employed, consultant, work on my own. And uh, I, use, uh, I use Google and Evernote very heavily, but I never feel like I'm truly, you know, using the fullest of their abilities. No matter how many online forums I try to find or whatever, it never really satisfies me. Do you think there's a place in the educational arena for a place that's set up, it looks maybe like Starbucks or something of that nature, but you can come in and you can talk to somebody who is very versed in things like that and help you become more efficient. And you know, it's human interaction, a very high tech thing, only sold online because it's all online, right? But you know, there's a place where you can go and interact with another human and bounce ideas off other business people uh, at a physical place. That would be if you're willing to pay for it. I, that would be there if you're willing to pay for it. And, and enough people are willing to pay for that. It would be there. Yeah. Yeah. So start, are you familiar with Starter Studio? All right, right here in, in Winter Park, we have a shared workspace for entrepreneurs and Starter Studio formerly Canvas. Yeah, so it's a shared workspace. Uh, Like-minded entrepreneurs, absolutely brilliant. We have a number of folks in this room that are in that shared space. Um, just a great place to, and they do have coffee, and it's free. <laughs> and so the snacks, they call them snacks, they're like fruit roll-ups and health bars and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> so you might want to bring your own food. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, sorry. new products or services on sort of display for people to come and try out and go and buy online. Brookstone. Yeah. Ari, that's what you should start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the showroom. Forget well, these bicycles. Because look at look store. at look at the le look at the lesson from Best Buy. Should you have a store where it is your showroom where you can get hands on, and instead of being embarrassed right in front of the TV, maybe you left the store before ordering. I didn't. Oh, make sure the model's the same. The Best Buy employees are like staring at me. I'm like, look, I'm ordering from Amazon. Could you not stare? <laughs> <laughs> and but if it was set up to do that, because people do want the high touch. I want to see it. I want to get some expertise on which one I should really buy, some of the spec and why this model is different than this model. They seem comparable, but the price point is $600 different. Yeah. Yep. Right, yep, yep. It's, it's happening, yep. yeah. Because particularly in high density areas like New York City, which I'm not sure if that's where, but in, Okay, yep. but in New York City, there's 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 a, there's several stores actually where you go in. There's no inventory there. You customize. It's all technology. You get you get. It's a customized clothing experience. And two days later, whatever yeah. it shows up. Everything. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think that would be a clever idea, Ari. And yeah. I don't I don't know that there's one that exists. So, yeah. so Brookstone, they, they see the writing on the wall and saying, yeah, we'll sell this to you in store, but you know that $15,000 massage chair? Yeah, try it out, but we're not going to have 15 in the back for people to come in and buy and have you know, a forklift to put it in your truck and so on. Yeah. 
At the Mall of, well, they used to have one at the Mall of the yeah, Millennia. <laughs> All right, a few more questions. Go ahead. So, oh, Professor I'm ready. I, I'm ready. <laughs> What's that? Not before you mean, a day. You mean Wait, the somebody did buy Fashion Square Mall, right? You mean the still standing <laughs> No, 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 no. Wait a second. He's worth about three, four, five billion. Yeah, exactly. They're buying these decrepit, you know, shopping centers built in the 60s and 70s, going into business, and they're turning them into delivery service operations for Uber Eats and these kinds of services that ride into the restaurant and even have a public facing. Well, that is a challenge. These shopping centers are so huge. And they don't have windows, as an example. How do you repurpose those? I don't know. You put a hotel right in the middle of it. Like it you'll square. notice it still hasn't gone up. Yeah, I noticed. <laughs> Someday. Yes, sir. Bricks and mortars going up. Well, that's well, orchard. Then what well, else? It's orchid or orchard. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, oh, yeah. The oh, yeah. Lowe's department store. Yeah. So, and the epitome of recycled shopping centers was the old Winter Park Mall. At one time, it was top of the line, recycled, and by most measures today, it would be successful. In 50 years, it'll be I was in Cheesecake Factory last, last night. <clears throat> Do you remember what was there? Yeah, Jordan Marsh was there. No, Nixon Ives, I think, was the last one. Uh, but see, if, if, if you think about this, Winter Park Village, right? And one of the keys to Winter Park Village are the stores, obviously, that are there, but the, the, um, the Regal Cinema, right? The Winter Park Village. What happened to movies? You go to Regal Park, I don't know if any of you have been to the uh, cinema lately, but when you go in there, I watched uh, Black Panther re recently, right? That was an awesome movie. It was an awesome movie. Go see it. That's not a commercial. But here's the thing. Here's the thing about that. How do we, how do we watch a lot of movies today? I'm always renting movies, right? But I'm, but, and movie theaters were dying. So Regal and all of those companies said, if all we're going to do is have a lousy chair and people are going to come in and look at a big screen, they're not doing it because they've got a big screen at home. Yep. What did they do? They, you, you put your feet yeah, up. Right. It's a massager. I mean, I fell asleep during some, not, I didn't fall asleep during that, but no, <laughs> but I'm saying they looked at this and they have the RPX experience yeah. and they're, they're creating yeah. an experience. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about. And the, yeah. The delivery, they'll bring food to you and the, all yeah. kinds of interesting things. So yeah. they looked at it and they said w the old model of simply having a seat and a big screen, yeah, that's on. dead because people can do that at home and have a much better experience actually. So they created a unique experience and I mean, it's working, it's working. All right, well, we are a few minutes over time. If you would, please help me in welcoming or thanking the group uh, and their thoughts on it today. <laughs> thank, thank all of you. Thank you so much for your participation. And thank all of you for attending. Uh, I understand. Mike, do you have any announcements? That's right. 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 Thank you so much.